on April 18th of 2010, around 5.30 in the morning in one of the boroughs of New York City, there was a man who attacked a lady that was walking on the street. He had a weapon with him, and so as a result, it wasn't very pretty. Another gentleman was walking by at the time. He was a homeless immigrant. It was early in the morning. This gentleman's name was Hugo. Didn't have much family, but he saw what was happening, and so he intervened. He went over, and he went after the man who was going to attack the woman. The woman ran off, and the man started running also, but Hugo ran after the man. And as he was running, the man turned around and attacked Hugo instead. So then he ran off, and this gentleman, Hugo, was left on the sidewalk. This is a true story. It was in the New York Times, New York Post, etc. This was around 5.30 in the morning, and there was a security camera nearby. So from someone's building, they had a camera that caught part of this, and they reviewed the tape later on. And they saw that at 5.30 in the morning, that there were people also around. And between 5.30 and 7.20, that's about an hour and a half, folks, about 20 people walked by, and nobody did anything. Not one person did anything. Well, one person did stop and touch him and see if he was still alive, but saw that he wasn't or saw that, well, he was injured, and he kind of went on his way. Somebody else they saw on the video camera stopped, took out their cell phone, but didn't call 911. They took a picture and kept on walking. Now, I don't, I don't know how the firefighters finally found out. Obviously, someone finally called 911, but over 20 people walked by and did absolutely nothing. That's pretty sad. I would say situations like that make God cry. I can only think that not only God, but angels in heaven probably cry when things like that happen on earth, when the children of God make poor decisions, when they don't care for one another. Hugo died. Hugo did not have a chance. So the one who was a good Samaritan, who intervened where he didn't have to, but he did, he ended up losing his life. And that was partly because of the fact he could have been saved, maybe. His wounds weren't that bad, but an hour and a half of the wounds were pretty bad. So it's appropriate when we hear this reading of the Good Samaritan to really think of ourselves, to think that, I would tell you, I would hate to think that something like that would happen here in Altamont Springs. When here we have this large parish, and it would pain me to think that people like ourselves would just drive by and not take notice. And there's a lot of issues today that make us question, well, should I stop, should I not? When we see somebody on the side of the road, when we see a car that's broken down, should I stop, should I not? Is there going to be liability involved? I'll tell you, when I was a freshman in college, he had just gotten a car, and it was my parents' old car. It was, it was old. I mean, this car was, I think, a 1978 like, Chevrolet Caprice. This was already, it was probably about seven, eight years old, but it was kind of a clunker, I'll tell you. And I was driving back from USF, where I was going to school, back over to Ormond Beach, and guess what? I got a flat. I'd only had the car about a month. I thought my parents would have given me good tires, but obviously that was my responsibility to change, and that's fine, but I got a flat tire on the way. I still remember whenever I go by it over in Lakeland, exactly where it happened, just past Lakeland. Now there's like this funky Florida Polytechnic thing there, the building that is like, where did that come from? But at the time there was nothing, it was just cows out there. And it was a hot summer day. And so my car was filled. I was going home for, from my first year of school, back over to Ormond Beach, and I pulled over on the side of the road, put a bunch of stuff on the side, Got the jack out, had never used it before. I realized, remember, they told us in driver's ed how to use it. And I got the jack out, and guess what? I put it under, and it wouldn't lift the car. And I didn't realize that there was this little switch on it that you had to switch in order to kind of get the car raised up. So 
I started panicking. No cell phones, no nothing. So I stood on the side of the road. And you know what? I started waving my arms back and forth, kind of going like this and saying, I hope someone stops. And I hope that they're good people, too, because you never know. And you know what? A car stopped from Nebraska, I think. Those Midwesterners, you gotta love them. They're always like so good, good hearted people. I'm always grateful to that person. I think they were like in a yellow Cadillac at the time. That time they had yellow cars and it was like acceptable. So, anyway, it was kind of interesting. And, you know, so the car stopped there on the side of the road and this nice older gentleman, he helped me. And I mean, I feel like such a fool. Here I am, this smart college student. And all I had to do was just click the switch and the jack would have gone up. Well, anyway, I thanked him. I was very grateful. I was the recipient of someone's Good Samaritan ways, of someone who stopped. And I wonder, wow, would I have done that myself? I have stopped before. I filter it. Do I do it enough? I'm not sure. Do I really stop and think too much about it, maybe? Or if I'm on the way somewhere to get to, like, to an appointment or a dinner or something, and like, oh, you know, well, what's the right thing to do? I think Jesus tells us what the right thing to do is. He's pretty clear on it. In this particular story, you see, the man who was robbed, you know, think about it. It said he was stripped and beaten, which means he had nothing. No wallet, no identity, nothing. When they stopped and the gentleman, the two people walked by, one was a priest. He was a man of religion. He walked on the opposite side. The Levite, who was of the priestly class, also of the tribe of Levi, he also walked on the other side. I'm not excusing them. But it's possible that they took very seriously the Jewish law, which was you don't get involved where there's blood or where there's injury, that that was considered unclean. So maybe in their very strict interpretation of the law that they said, well, I'm going to follow the law. But you know, there's times where we have to say love in and law out, where we have to kind of look at the opposite and say, you know, I have to look beyond the law. So their actions were, were inexcusable because this is a human being there. Now look at the Samaritan who was despised. People wouldn't even go through Samaria. It was like the worst of the worst of areas. And the people from there were, were they were just despised. I don't know what other word I could think of some, but I'd rather not say them that were, you know, used for the Samaritans. But who stopped the Samaritan? It's pretty shocking. He had a heart. His heart was pure. And not only did he care for the gentleman and bring him to the inn or the place where he could get well, he left money and he said, I'd follow through. Wow, follow through. That's a really big thing. That's like even going a step further. And we also have to think that the gentleman who was robbed, he allowed a Samaritan to help him. Maybe he was unconscious, he had no idea. But he could have woken up and said, wow, you're not a good person. I, you're of the people that we don't like. I have you boxed in, so I don't want you helping me. Well, I don't know of anybody who was in that position that would say, I don't want you helping me. Didn't matter to me. When I was in that time of need, it didn't matter who came and stopped by. I was just so grateful that someone cared. This man who was robbed was so grateful that someone cared, that someone would have stopped and taking care of his wounds. And so really when we think about this of who is our neighbor, maybe it's a time when we have to kind of expand that view of neighbor. Many people take pride here in the world today that we're in this global society. Well, you know what that means? That neighbor might be a little more expanded. Although it's kind of easy to just write a check for someone on the other side of the world but never have to get involved. You know, our neighbor is right nearby. If you live in an apartment, you have a ceiling, your neighbor has the floor above. You know, that's one definition of neighbor. But neighbor is also the person down the street, maybe not directly connected to you, who might be in need. And with all of the things that are self-centered today, iPads, iPods, iPhones, there's an awful lot of I and not a lot of we. And so it's pretty important to make sure we expand what that means. To look a little further and to look beyond 
maybe what someone's background is, what their culture is, that we don't profile somebody, but rather that we look at them with great love. You know, Jesus came into the world, not just for one group of people. He didn't come into the world to only save the Hebrew people. He came for all people. That's pretty important to remember. So if we're kind of questioning and wondering, well, should I help, should I not? We might want to remember, you know, what would Jesus want us to do? What would Jesus want us to do? Maybe more importantly, ask the question, because that's pretty obvious. We know what the answer is. Who does Jesus want us to be? Well, Jesus wants us also to be a good Samaritan. Jesus wants us to be able to say, you know, I will put my needs on the back burner for a moment, and I'm going to place someone else's needs in front. There's an old proverb that says, when your neighbor's house is burning, make sure you carry water to your own. That's kind of selfish. I think we would hear that and say, well, that doesn't sound like a very nice way to be. I think we need to twist it around and kind of think, you know what, when the neighbor's house is burning, we better go put that fire out first before it starts affecting our own. Let's make sure that we help one another and look maybe beyond what's on the outside and think of what's on the inside. And on the inside of every human being, of every person, is the image and likeness of God. That really, no matter who the person is, where they come from, what they look like, every person has the image and likeness of God. And it is from there that we get our dignity, the gift of dignity. And when humanity treats one another in a dignified manner, God is happy. The angels are happy. The saints dance in heaven. But when they don't, I think there's a lot of tears shed. And I don't think we want to be responsible for our own actions to be causing tears in heaven. It sounds like a song, I think. Somewhere along the line there was one. So really today, who is our neighbor? Maybe think of how you answer that question. Who is your neighbor? And maybe don't think of who's not my neighbor, but rather think who is my neighbor. It might expand the world a little bit more. And not only will it bring heaven a little bit more joy, but it might bring earth a little bit more joy as well.